We have a very special guest in the building. This is going to be an exclusive interview, as I call it, because we're coming from an international worldwide perspective. This is our stigma, taboos and stereotypes, world childhood domestic violence and traumas part four series. So we're going to have this ongoing series as we tackle domestic violence from a holistic and a worldwide perspective. I am your host, LP. We're going to be bringing on Leah Abraham after this particular interview to provide her feedback and her comments because she's our partner in this series. We got a very special guest in the building, but before I introduce her, let me give you all the disclaimers. So uncensored conversations, exchange information, provide resources. If you're triggered at any point during this conversation that we're going to have and you need help immediately, and I'm talking about just here in the States, call 911. If you're in the UK, 999. That will get you police, fire, and EMS services if you have an immediate need. If you don't have an immediate need, but you still need help, we provide a bunch of information for you in every show description for every episode of the Trigger Want to Talk podcast. We have the numbers for domestic violence, and their websites. We provide information for a company called RAIN, which stands for Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network here in the States. That number and website is available. If you are experiencing any trafficking issues, we provide the number and website. If you have substance abuse issues, we provide three bits of information for you. al for the supporters, Alcoholics Anonymous for those dealing with alcoholism, and Narcotics Anonymous for those that are dealing with any substance abuse issue. Also, if you are suicidal, if you know somebody that's suicidal, if you are aware of a suicidal issue, call 988. 988 is the number that's available toll free 24 seven here in the United States for any suicidal issues and any other behavior health concerns, they can point you into the right direction. That being said, we got a very special guest that's going to be talking with us today. Her name is Mahar Nagar, and she is an ongoing trauma CPTSD and PTSD expert. She's a trauma survivor. She's an expert on women. She works with people dealing with childhood, parental, generational traumas and abuses. Again, this is part of our World Series event where we're talking about stigmas and taboos and stereotypes. I want to thank you for your time today. I'm so glad that we're going to be having this conversation. Peace and blessings be upon you. How are you doing? Thank you so much, Larry. I am so uh, thankful for people uh, like you and many others who do this podcast to help others, not just knowing where to get help, but know what are trauma triggers and what it looks like because I come from a, a part of my part of the world. A lot of people don't even know what is trauma, even if they're educated, but all they know is anxiety, depression, and few other things. And they don't know what trauma looks like, how triggers look like, what they should do about it, and, and things like that. So thank you so much for, for doing this. No, we appreciate your presence and your information that you're going to share. I want to get started just giving the listeners and the watchers, because this audio podcast is also available via Spotify and our YouTube channel, which is Pen Pen and Consultant Solution LLC. Give us a little information on your background. Sure. I, I will start this way, Larry. I always tell people, don't see me just as a trauma expert and a th or a therapist. Please see me as a survivor first, because I, I got into trauma when I was in my mother's home, is what I feel, because after knowing history not complete history but whatever i i got to know about my parents and how they started you know their marriage and everything i am sure that it all started there and it took so many years for me to even understand that i have trauma issues it took a lot of years for people to accept in in our place it said that you are mentally gone <laughs> So people used to say, oh, maybe she's mentally gone because they, they don't know what is mental health about, as I said, right? And I'm glad that after, after COVID hit and people started accepting it, 
uh, people at least now know a lot of things about uh, mental health. Uh, you know, a lot of segments about mental health is what I mean because that is also one thing which they weren't aware about. That's how my journey started. Not just as a trauma survivor from my mother's womb, but I had lots of abuses since my childhood, all kind of abuses, not to, I don't want to miss any of those because uh, I was a completely different person. Uh, when I say this, I mean that people, you know, people of my age and a lot of others, even elders, there, there were many people who, who used to find it very difficult to resonate with me, okay, to understand why I'm doing why I'm uh, saying few things, why I'm behaving in a certain way, what I'm doing and things like that. I got into a forced arranged marriage and that's what my parents, uh, my pa parents also got into arranged marriage. They, ne they, they never wanted to get into it and they got in and they made me also get into a forced arranged marriage and live it for five years. They, I lived it for five years for them to save their family reputation, social Thing, you know, social reputation and things like that and at the same time I had this fear of what if I will uh, what if I will leave the marriage uh, what will happen to my sister so I continued I went through abortions which made me go through uh, six abortions in the span of six months which made me uh, go through immense uh, grief and then I, honestly, I, I loved someone and I thought maybe I'll get married to, to that man. But then things weren't going right and it that relation happened to end me being a rape, uh, victim to survivor. And that's, that's one, after that, I was all over the place. I was, I was nowhere. I knew that uh, there is something really, really not just wrong with me, but I need to seek help. I see. I started seeking help. I started uh, looking out for uh, psychiatric help. I took medication. It didn't. It wasn't helping. We we are still working on on our mental health aid. We have worked a lot, but there is still a lot of uh, resources. A lack of resources. They, they aren't enough resources here if that makes sense so if you see i'm the only yeah i'm the only only one in india who is working on trauma that to somatic healing therapy i'm the only one nobody else is working on this you're getting it right so that's 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 where uh, that's where we stand now and that's why I started this, because after my healing journey, I realized there must be so many women who must be suffering all alone. They, they are not just suffering, but, you know, at times the struggle becomes too much to take on, too much to hold on. And it is it becomes very easier for everybody to say it's okay, specifically in, in, in our culture, because I come from a... a Hindu family and then I changed my religion to Islam and all of that out of my uh, own willingness. So in both the overall culture wise it's been said you have to be more, uh, you should compromise more, you, ch you should adjust more, you should be patient and that becomes too much. You know ma'am, you are you're getting it is like they do too, women do too much of it and they end up being that wondering that that's how I need to be that's how I should be because that's what I've been told to do if I have to be in this life only then I'll be good only then things will be right and they don't realize that there is a limit to something you know there is a point wherein you need to break it and say no this is not just enough but i am i'm not i don't want to take it anymore because this is not right right you took a stand so That's your words yes so i come from that this is about me my journey and my this is my journey is the main reason why i started uh, my work um uh, with uh, not just being a trauma expert and therapist, but genuine conversations with Meher because I 
I felt that we all need that place of extreme vulnerability wherein we can be ourselves completely. We don't have to uh, think or hold on to those thoughts or things or everything. You know, because when you are in trauma, I, I would want to say this uh, before we go ahead with the next thing is that when I was in this entire journey of multiple traumas, I was homeless, I went through fin uh, financial abuse as well, spiritual abuse, physical, verbal abuse, and a lot more, as I said, uh, since my childhood and after that as well. Because I changed my religion. You see, in India, in our country, Hindu-Muslim is a big thing. It's a huge thing. I am sure a lot of people listening here must be aware about it because they listen a lot, you know, news uh, after, you know, news through news. So, all I, and all I got to feel and realize at one point in time is that, Larry, is that, you know, it's okay. If you did something just for your survival at that point in time and you didn't know how to survive it, you know, how to get over it, it's okay. We all do that mistake. You don't have to live that forever. You don't have to punish yourself to live that. Whether it is in the, fame, in the form of your shame, guilt, or whatever be it. I want to thank you for your candor and your compassion and the courage that you have coming onto this platform as other platforms, because I'm sure you've done many other podcasts and you're going to do many more. We're going to be focusing on four areas during this conversation, including your story. We're going to be talking about the things that we cover on this podcast, human and sex trafficking from your perspective, especially how you view it and see it and what's going on in your neck of the woods, as we call it. Also, domestic violence, and you touched on that. We're going to be talking about trafficking, and we're also going to be talking about a couple of... I, I said four, but I want to add two other components. I want to talk about arranged marriages, because you touched on that also. And, you know, to wrap up the work that you're doing for those women over there through you, you an online trauma healing through what's called somatic therapy. I want you to explain that, but we'll talk about that a little later on in the podcast. I want to go back and rewind the clock a little bit. I want to go back to when you were a younger person uh, around your teens. When we did our pre-interview last week, you talked about your dad, your biological dad, you hate. I want you to explain what was the cause of that hatred. So I'll be honest at this point in time because I feel this is something we need to normalize. Uh, one of the reasons is that I know in a lot, of, you know, in a lot of places, I mean, places, parents are being considered as God. They are godly figures, and they are being considered that no one is above them. You know, God is there, and because God couldn't be there, so then mom is there, and your father is there so i was i would want to add on one more thing to this is that i hate my father and i also I, I, there have been times wherein i have hated my mom as well okay i i like her maybe i i don't hate her more than i hate my father but i hate her too for a lot of reasons and one of the reasons is that even though I'm a trauma survivor and I work in this area, I would want to, I, I want to say this, okay? Even if I'm aware about all of this and I know that my mom didn't know a lot of it and she also suffered in her marriage because my father was very abusive to her. He used to beat her and abuse her, verbally abuse her and all of that. I have seen all of that happening and I, I know you know insult her publicly he he used to insult her publicly i've seen that happening but at the same time my mom is i i hate her also at the same time is i'm gonna highlight both the things is is it's also because how my mom treated me when i was a teenage and she might not be you know she would have forgotten but i still remember i used to go 
for my you know to play outside or maybe tuitions or something you know after my tuition classes i used to play for a while and come back home a little, little late like any other child right like i was not a studious <laughs> kid i was someone who wants who who wanted that uh, i should go out and play i should not be i don't want to be studying yeah exactly right? right and i used to come back home late a little late which doesn't mean a, what around maybe uh, 6 37 or maybe 8 pm at night or something and then around around that time and my i remember a lot of times my mom saying where were you were you were you in the garden and i used to get shocked sure, what is she talking why were you were you uh, were you with this guy were you in the garden with this guy was he doing this this to you and i was like what what is she talking about and she has done this multiple times with me multiple times and i'm sure if i'm going to go right now and remind her that she will say no i've not done that you are lying so i don't speak about it you see how she she can easily put everything on me and then remind me Out of everything she has done, that because of me you got educated. Because of me you are this, you are that, you are this. You know how how she is manipulating me now. Now she is reminding me all the thing, all the good things she did, but she doesn't remember what what she did to me, how much harm she has caused me, right? Right. And and I I didn't as a teenager. Obviously, I didn't know what all of this means, right? Like. Obviously, I, during my time, nobody knew. We learned it so late. We learned it so late. What is this sex is all about? How kids are produced and things like that. And and your own mom coming up to you, not just saying this, but suspecting you, constantly suspecting you. And then you say that you are the one to whom we get ridiculed, or maybe. you make us feel in whatever you know low in you know you put us down or maybe you make us feel that and this and this is how this everything happened and my father coming up and saying to me from nowhere that uh i i would want to say this is because i know a lot of women might be hearing this who are in need or maybe maybe gone through something like this and my father not only used to physically abuse my mom he used to physically and verbally and emotionally uh, he used to abuse me as well spiritually as well if he he wants me to do certain uh, spiritual things or whatever in a certain way we have we have to do it we we have no option we cannot deny we cannot do anything if he will do it there will be a huge fight at our place huge fight and that to on on okay on on uh very special uh, moments or occasions that oh. that's how it was normal for us you know so for me it was like holidays equals to uh if i have to say now holidays equals to huge traumatic triggers and i that's why i never used to go up to my for my holidays or to my parents place even when when you know i was in my um college or schooling days so all i want to say here is why do i hate my father and some of my mother is because that's how they normalized all of this abuse for me and they kept on doing it and i tried my level best for so 25 30 years to make our relationship better i did everything i could and nothing happened and even now now it is too late now it is too late for me to 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 be like i oh, know i don't want to do anything for you i'm sorry i'm done with you i'm done right <laughs> and and that's when i i am saying now yes i hate my, my father i still hate my father because he hasn't changed and he is the same man and that was what i that's what i told him this time Listen, you have abused my mom for many years, and after abusing my mom, because my mom said nothing to you, doesn't mean you can abuse me. You cannot abuse me. I'm not gonna take your abuse. I'm not here to take your abuse. And just because I'm not, I, I'm your daughter. I don't. I am not able to take all of this nonsense of yours. I'm sorry. 
if i have had to take all this nonsense of yours why would i leave my abusive marriage of 5 years because that man was better than you so i think no, i have answered <laughs> no that that is phenomenal and i always say you can't explain the logical to the illogical some people just are not going to get it i don't care you can have a library of congress amount of information pictures videos documents your own words you can give them all of that stuff and they're still like stuck on stupid or they just are intentionally ignorant like they don't want to know the truth they don't want to hear the truth they don't want to accept your truth and not only that they don't want to accept your facts because you can back up everything that you say this is i always tell people like for me there's a difference between truth and facts a fact is i know one plus one equals two you know that it's proven there's no debate on that my name is larry pinson i was born january 26 1971 you know my last force of my social ends in blank 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 you know what i mean like so i can prove those things that's facts truth would be i'm the greatest man alive you know something like that or you know i believe that white is a signification of you being a good person you know just I, you know i can come up with anything this pen is the best pen that was ever made you know though that's my truth it doesn't mean that it's a fact so when we're talking about these stigmas and taboos and stereotypes in a lot of religions you know like christianity says honor your mother and your father for your days will be long well if you're not a religious person you may be like well that's that's a bunch of crap you can be a religious person and say eh, i might have to put an asterisk by that because if my mom or my dad traumatized me how can i honor them wholly truly fully i'm thankful that they brought me into this world kind of ends right there you know what i mean like that, that's about it like thank you for birthing me peace and blessings we ain't got nothing else to talk about i i, I gave it a shot i gave it multiple shots you still don't want to accept it whether it's responsibility or even that this is a fact or these are facts you don't want to be part of that healing that I am working on, that I'm working with other people on. I became an expert because of my own shit. So thank you very much. Have a nice life. This is the Trigger One and Talk podcast. We have uncensored conversations. So you might hear some adult language. This podcast is made for adults, by adults. And if you want your kid to listen to any of these conversations, that's okay. Please be right there with them. Don't let them watch this podcast by themselves. It's just like going to an R-rated movie. You know, you want to have some adult there so you can help bridge the gap between the information and have a dialogue with that person because some of this stuff might be over their head. Some of this stuff they may not understand fully. Some of this stuff may be triggering to them. If you need any help immediately, or you know somebody that needs immediate help because of this conversation or any of these podcast episodes, call 911. That'll give you police, police fire and EMS. If you don't have an immediate need, we list a bunch of resources in the show notes for every episode that we do. We have a very special guest that we're talking with, Hair Nagar. She's in India. She is a trauma expert. She's talking about not only her story, but a bunch of things from a worldwide perspective and we're talking about stigmas taboos and stereotypes dealing with world childhood domestic violence and traumas this is part four of our series leah abraham is going to be joining us later after Maher's interview and at the end of this interview just like every interview under our true crime banner we do a missing person case this case is going to be about a young lady named kayla kelly I got a short video I'm going to play and cover her story, but we'll get to that later. Here, yeah. in Asia and in India specifically, you talked about the lack of money, power, and resources for women who are traumatized 
with sexually based offenses and domestic violence and even trafficking. I want to start with trafficking first. What is the trafficking scene like in India? Well, if I have to make it simple, I think not just in India, but uh, things I'm talking about, uh, a lot of it are part of Asian countries, a lot of Asian countries. Because that's how our, our tradition and culture has been for so many years, right? And there, is, there are so many similarities and things which we are being uh, raised and taught all our lives. So when you are being taught that you are a woman, you are weak, you have to listen to a man, it becomes very easier for a l lot of people women to not just get into human trafficking but a lot of men and other people even women around you to do it and i would want to uh, share a couple of experiences not just of mine but one of my clients as well that uh one of my clients mom uh sold her for money because they don't she doesn't have father they needed money so she sold her daughter for money to a man and she uh, she told that uh, he is your he is the man you are gonna get married to. But after few years or months, I am I'm not sure. But that's what she said. After some time, she she got to know that he is not the one whom she's you know he he is not his fian her fiance. Rather, she has been sold to this man. So this man was using her on bed. Uh, got her pregnant then she had to abort the child she was maybe very less she was only 15 years old also when this happened all right and this was happening for around three to four years when i met her she must be around uh, 2020 i don't know this happened around that when she was 16 or 17 so she wasn't too young when this happened and uh, it was devastating for her that her own mother sold her uh, for money because she needed a lot of money for whatever reasons and, and she couldn't do anything about it. She continued doing it because this man now is not just using her physically but uh, you know as I I said you are being told that you are a woman and you have to listen to men and they start manipulating not just manipulating i think it's, it's more like controlling you controlling your your um, um, you mentally and physically and emotionally and then because they can control all of that verbally and all of that then they think that they can control more and then right right so it's like if you give your hand, your, your, you know, your uh, palm to shake hand and they will take, uh, they, they will assume that you, they own the entire body. It's more like that. It's like an anecdote, what I'm trying to say that they will, they, they will not assume, it's not an assumption. They will literally treat you as if they, they own your entire body and it became so difficult for her to get over him, out of him. She tried her level best that she he used to torture her he used to come back torture her and there were people who used to be always behind her she can't go and meet anyone because whatever whosoever she is meeting uh, there are spies behind her who will keep an eye on her and who will notify him about uh, whatever you know her whereabouts and what she's doing and what whatever is happening and it was so much terrifying for her and that is also one of the reasons which made her stick there and keep on doing all of this because now her mom is pushing her to do it. If she doesn't do it, he will call, uh, you know, her mom and her mom will say go and do it. And her mom intentionally used to send her to that place, to that man's house. And this was happening in front of everyone, even she used to go to that man's house. So now you are seeing not, not only her mother is involved, that man's mother is also involved. And she isn't aware about that what is 
what is happening what is his son you know doing and all of that after all of this she somehow she got some strength and she said that my mom sold me to your son and i'm not your i'm i'm not your uh, daughter in law and i have this heard so i have heard so many stories uh, larry i when i say stories i won't say only stories but real instances of real people wherein men force women to sleep with their uh oh heads their co-workers and what not it is very common to do swapping of wives wherein wife, your wife will go to another wife or to another man and their wife will come to you just for business purpose and i know all of this is considered normal here because that's how they beautify it but this is human trafficking because now you are using women just to fulfill your needs and they are being misused just to fulfill your needs all your needs your financial yes. need right if you need money if you need whatever yeah even that you are fulfilling by making your own wife going to sleep on bed with not just that i have heard women sleeping with their father in law that means their husband's father oh. and they are being forced to do sex in front of him a friend of mine wrote a book and she talked about her ex husband having uh um, these type of sexual acts done where he liked watching her have sex with other men he was forcing this these activities upon her and she details this in this book that she recently wrote for you being someone who's a trauma expert when you de- when you talk about human and sex trafficking one of the things that i tell people is there's still the stigma and taboo and stereotype that trafficking happens from a, a united states perspective a lot of people still think that you have these foreign foreigners coming to the united states in like a shipping container being stowed away on some boat or something like that coming to the us across the atlantic ocean to some port of call like new york or Miami or wherever and and being dumped into the states to do these sex uh trafficking work or human trafficking type of activities. You're talking about it from a domestic point of view. You you didn't say these young ladies are being put in a shipping container or being shipped over to the United States. You're saying that this stuff is happening right here, right there locally. and it's happening within families not even necessarily strangers per se and the families are actively participating in not only selling their loved one they're actually being involved in some of the sex acts this is why i wanted to have you be a guest on the show because we're talking from a worldwide perspective we're also saying that wherever you live domestic violence can happen most people just think of domestic violence happening under your roof in between the four walls that surround you that's true when we're talking about domestic violence take the two words that you put together violence is violence no matter what type of violence emotional physical mental all of those things you add the domestic component to it domestic is wherever you live wherever you have domesticated yourself when you go to work If you have a desk, most people put little pictures or they put personal items. They domesticated that little space even if it's a cubicle. So if an act of violence happened at the workplace, that's a domestic violence issue. When we're talking about trafficking, you don't have to be on a boat to be trafficked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you you don't even have to cross the street let alone cross the state line or the county line or the leave your country to be trafficked. I did a show last year talking about an American citizen who was 15 went to a uh, a professional basketball game with her dad. She never showed back up after leave after going to the bathroom. He called the cops. They couldn't find her. After a few days he contacted a trafficking organization a nonprofit organization here in the United States um they found her 
she, they were in Texas. They found her in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which is the neighboring state to the north. After eight days, this girl was being pimped out in traffic online, and the guy that had her renting out eight motel rooms at this particular motel in Oklahoma City. They called Oklahoma City PD. They raided the place. They uh, rescued the young lady, and they arrested all of those participants. How much mental help is she going to need? Not only her, her family. You know, so this was a trafficking situation. It was a domestic violence type of situation. She was, it was a sexually based offense, you know, and it fell under the true crime thing because it was a crime. So she was an American, she's an American citizen. Folks, this stuff happens worldwide. It has nothing to do with just some foreign person coming here to the United States. When you're talking about domestic violence and you've talked about not only your own experience for those women in India would you tell us the top four things that women deal with when it comes to domestic violence what are what are the the big ticket items that you tend to counsel and consult with your clients on when it comes to dv Sure. So I I would I think I would want to uh, probably clarify one thing also that Larry the initial instant whatever I spoke about those weren't only uh, domestic violence those are real human trafficking things which happens within the family or within the uh, in a way that you will not even, you will not get to know it is human talking. When making sense, you will feel it is it is just like someone using you for their benefit. Okay. Right. And now that now that I'm I'm coming to domestic violence, uh, up, domestic abuse or things, I think. This is the difference between human trafficking and domestic abuse. So domestic abuse isn't something it is an abuse it is also it it is exploitation i am not denying but the, it it's not an exploitation unlike what we spoke about human trafficking okay. here here people are exploiting you uh, your husband will beat you but it will be more of you are my wife you are not gonna go anywhere you are gonna remain here only you cannot do this you are not supposed to do that you cannot stand here things like that am i am i making sense so yes. because i have heard a lot of stories of a lot of women not just mine but a lot of women uh, that's when i also learned the difference between these two things Okay. And because a lot of women don't know the difference between these two things, they feel it's normal. Okay. That so is it a cultural thing? Is it a religious thing? Like what what why do they feel it's normal? Well, as I said, it is more of a, a traditional and cultural thing. Okay? So it's simple. If my you know, just take up let's i just want to do this differentiation not just you know for for all of us for all the listeners so that they know the difference between this so when her mother you know one of my clients mother she sold it was clear human trafficking we will agree to that right when a woman when a woman a wife is being forced to sleep with a head or a, or a co-head or whatsoever do you, do you agree that it's human trafficking? It is. Because now you are forcing a woman to sell her body just to fulfill your demands. I agree. Right? And now, when it comes to abuse, after doing all of this, you will come back home. You will force her to be like you. As in, I don't want you to go outside. I don't want you to um, uh, go for shopping without informing me. You cannot speak with your friends. You cannot speak with your parents. You cannot have friends. Where I am going? Why are you not telling me? This is abuse. 
and this comes in the state of you have both of these happen the same way it can happen with the same way and that way it can be easy for them to understand what the hell is happening with me that's a, i don't know it is something uh, confusing but it is confusing for a lot of people right imagine this is this is i'm not um, making i have heard real stories from real women women did not just traffic but she she got married to a man she came up to her and said okay now you are not going to do this work he i'm going to get married to you she was a prostitute you she got married to him and after marriage this man used to do the same thing with her you are not a good woman you are this you are that and he used to literally i cannot say these words i i am i am having my i'm sorry if this is going to trigger know. anybody listening here no but, but in my she has been For so many years, and after that, somehow that man shows that he's very nice and kind and whatsoever. She gets married to this man, and this man is is literally not just abusing her, but it's like uh, it's beyond that at times because it's like my torture. You cannot do this. You cannot go there. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why are you speaking with your parents? You cannot have people around. You cannot have friends around. and things like that so i am not sure have i answered your question with your domestic violence thing but yes this is what domestic violence may look like a lot of women now you answered it well and i want to i want to say to everyone that's listening uh because mahar is in india right now there may be a lag in the comments and in the commentary and Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you might uh, want to turn your captions on, especially if you're watching this podcast. Uh, we want you to understand that these conversations that we're having on the Trigger One and Talk podcast can be triggering, not only for the listener, but for the people and the person that's telling their story. This is why... we emphasize if you're triggered at any point and you need help immediately call 911 or call 999 if you're in the UK if you don't have an immediate need we provide resources in the show notes in the description for every podcast interview that we do i want to jump over to the sexually based offenses portion just briefly to ask you and i can lump in the trafficking and domestic violence what resources are available for women that are being trafficked that are victims or survivors of domestic violence and or sexually based offenses because like i said we have a, a number of these resources available here in the states what's available in india who do they call well well for me uh, well uh, there are society uh, uh, numbers available when you feel society but i'm not sure what about the uh, about the uh, domestic violence and human trafficking because as i st- said it is still very confusing in a lot of ways for a lot of people and uh, i i would be truly honest with everyone <laughs> that that's why i um, i can give myself as a resource for people not just in india but asian countries because as i said what the, the things i am coming up this is common um, in in a lot of asian countries because we share same uh, culture and traditions as i spoke about so probably just reach out to me on instagram or uh, Instagram or links been shared and all of that, and I can help you with it. I think uh, that's the best thing I can do. I'm going to put on the screen right now for those that are watching your two links. You have your IG page, and um, you have your website, which is Genuine Conversations with Maher. dot com. Uh, and on here on your website, you say 
India's only online trauma healing through somatic therapy that helps working women not just heal, but get their power back by being and living their authentic selves. Discover you get your power and wings back through a healing journey with my hair. And I love what you have on your website. For starters, you say unhealed and left alone trauma is the biggest reason we cannot maintain and practice healthy relationships. Unhealed trauma greatly impacts the overall growth of your life, brain, and body. The body keeps the score, folks. Remember that. And there's a book that's titled the same thing. Healing with love and compassion, kindness, and the journey to know your authentic self is what we need the most. Let me help you know about yourself and be your authentic selves. You have a free webinar that you offer on the website. It talks about knowing your trauma triggers in the brain and the body, uh, the impacts of generational parental and childhood abuses and trauma, which is a huge reason why we're having you on this ongoing STS, Stigmas, Taboos, and Stereotypes series that we're doing with Leah Abraham and others. And you talk about in this webinar, how does trauma impact our bodies and brains forever until it's healed? You have such... A, a great website uh, as I'm scrolling through it and as I was doing my research you give so many different tools and articles and information you talk about the six ways to handle your trauma the simple felt the simple task felt impossible that's an article I want you to tell us about that particular article the simple task felt impossible I would. I didn't get it. Would you? I mean, I. What is that? I didn't get the question. On your website, you have a uh, an article that's titled "The Simple Task Felt Impossible." Can you tell us about yes. that article? Sure. That's my cover story. That includes um, how my trauma start. How my par my grandparents and parents are equally responsible for my. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's why if you would have seen, I work not just with, uh, I, I don't, I don't just work with uh, abuses part or, uh, you know, I work with parental and generational trauma and plus childhood trauma because, because that's how they normalized it. And in that article, I have spoken about, you know, how I have seen, um, not just my, as I spoke about earlier, Larry, that I have seen, when I was five, I've seen my mom getting physically abused by my, uh, my, my biological father and his mom, middle of the night, middle of midnight, around two or three something. And I was sitting outside uh, the main road, there were stairs, I was sitting outside all alone and figuring out what is happening, why all of this is happening and things like that. So, that entire article is all about how my, about my story, how, how my trauma started, how I started working on my healing journey. Because I realized that as a trauma, even as a trauma expert, I have to keep working on my healing journey. I cannot say that, oh, I... I uh, I shouldn't be working on myself because that's not the truth. I am working on something which is intense and there are times it, it, it impacts me. Honestly, it, it is something which might trigger me as which might trigger me as a human, you know, though I am a therapist and and that's how the healing journey is I and mean, happen is is for me and I, happened and and then i started this work so it's all about that i got a few more questions on your website you have an article that says six ways to handle your trauma can you briefly tell us those six ways sure so uh, these six ways is more about first of all for all um, specifically for all the audience who is listening in uh from uh, not just India, but Asian countries uh, specifically. Uh, 
it's for everyone who doesn't know what is trauma about first is you should know what is trauma what is what are what is what are your you know what is trauma trigger what are your trauma triggers you should we should have basic knowledge about that that is more important uh, as i uh, I have mentioned there and I have mentioned now earlier as well that there is lack of knowledge about it in our country and I I literally have to sit down and <laughs> tell people what is trauma and how what triggers are because everyone says oh everyone has some or the other struggle that doesn't mean it is trauma and things like that after okay. knowing. For knowing, it is very important to not to accept it because a lot of people go in denial mode, and they they don't want to uh, you know accept and acknowledge it that they have this issue, or even if they might be accepting it, it becomes very difficult for them to go and seek help. It is very important for. For us to seek help because there are times we give, give we try our level best to you know uh, to do our best and do everything I we can. As I spoke about how I started my journey journey you know uh, healing journey. I I looked out for psychiatrists. It wasn't working. And then he said change the place and do this and do that. A lot of things. And then finally I realized no therapy is something which will help me. So it is is very important to help and. And while seeking help, to put yourself, you did when you are triggered. It is important to not just accept, acknowledge, but also uh, be more uh, conscious and aware about yourself. So grounding techniques is more about being conscious about you. Okay, I am triggered. That's why I am feeling frustrated. Okay, I am. I this has hurt me and this is triggering me. That's why maybe I'm uh, angry or I'm annoyed for no reason. So if you have all of these triggers, you know it. There are triggers which are physical in nature. That's why I do somatic healing therapy. So which is about healing not just uh, your uh, body, but it, it's about healing your brain and body. So your triggers when in your don't just impact your brain, but it impacts your body as well. Okay. And I am sure that uh, there is this uh, thing of honest. I respect everyone. I respect your views. Where people will say, "Okay, forgive people and move on," because forgiving, uh, forgiving them helps me to heal and to focus on me. It is your call. But I, I believe, I strongly believe from my personal journey because I, as I said, I am a survivor first of all, and then a therapist. So I haven't forgiven a lot of people because I didn't feel like forgiving them because they are still doing the same thing and I can I don't want to forgive them I don't want to make them feel that they can do everything with anyone and everyone will forgive uh, them or maybe nothing you know no offense but nothing will happen to them. am I making sense right so all you yes. respect to people who want to forgive but. I I completely believe you don't have to follow people around every time to be yourself or just to move on uh, with your life. Absolutely. It's not people say it's not necessary. And here I have mentioned about don't burden yourself. I would also want to add on that don't overjudge yourself. There are times wherein we overjudge ourselves. We think no, maybe I am I am too much. I am thinking so much. It Thing is wrong. I am this. I am that. Because we are made to feel that. I told you right how human trafficking can happen with the same women, and you know human trafficking plus domestic violence can happen with the same women within her house. Correct. Correct. So if if that is so much confusing and you don't have parental support because after marriage, what happens? A lot of parents abandon their uh, their, their you know girls. And they say now, now you are married. It is not our responsibility. If your marriage is not working, it is your problem. You have to figure this out. You have to do this, and they are being left alone yep. to their, uh, you know, to their agony. And they they don't know how to get out of it. They don't know how to survive it. They don't know what what they should go do about it. And that is on top of it, they are being constantly told that you are the one who is the problem. 
you know who creates uh, the mess who is who creates the problem who is this who is that and that's why please please don't not just don't over uh, judge or burden yourself but don't over and last thing which is uh, finding the right therapist i think a lot of people definitely struggle with this they go to a lot of therapists and it it works it doesn't work and things like that and that is one of the reasons that it is very important to know with whom you can work and you can be completely yourself and you feel uh, resonated and connected if you don't feel like uh, it just don't go for it i love those six ways you know i love it. yeah I love because it. you know when you, you thank you much larry because i i want to say one thing is because i understand when a lot of women and men a lot of people go through this healing journey it can be very painful first of all you are anyways going through triggers and then you keep changing therapist and things like that it's like oh i'm done with this i don't want to go to any therapist anymore you know because you lose that patience in you at times you lose hope also in finding a good one hi i mean in finding the right one and i i know it's okay it's fine but don't you know one thing you don't i always say this to myself don't abandon yourself so please don't abandon yourself and don't abandon your healing journey just because you haven't been able to find the right um ther- person or therapist for you yeah this article was written in global woman magazine it's listed on her website which is uh, going to be listed in the show notes also Gen- genuine conversations with mahair.com is the website that you can find the six ways to handle your trauma as well as the simple t- task felt impossible article and all these other bits of information that she has on her website she has a free workshop she also um, has a free webinar that's available to help you handle trauma and its effects you know Mahar, you have such a bevy of information that we appreciate these resources because that's what the trigger one to talk podcast is about uncensored conversation exchanging information and providing resources i got one final question before we we wrap up if you could write a letter or an email to little Maher at whatever age that you were a minor what would you say i will take a deep breather first of all before writing the letter and instead of writing start, i will start my letter this say i won't write oh meher i love you so much i think love is more about verb i it's it's an action which we do not just we do not just to others but even to ourselves so i would say to myself is it's okay meher you did know a lot of things my darling my name is parul as well because that's what my parents kept so my name is meher parul so i will say parul you know my darling you were very small understand all of this and i i know how dark darkest places you have been there alone by yourself not even making anyone realize that you are there because you always used to smile and all people know all many people felt and believe that you always smile never understood your pain and never could see your pain and i know how give it how terrible and miserable you have felt how, i know how lost and abandoned you would have felt i know all of those feelings and i know how those feelings didn't only haunt you when you were small but it kept on haunting you until you started your healing journey started working on your healing and that's why i would want to first of all thank you that you have put in that effort to do that for you because a lot of people don't do that they don't want to get out of that i, I know a lot of people around me who don't want to get out of their pain their their uh, triggers and their traumas but you have put in that effort for yourself and i'm glad that you have not just put in that effort but you you always try your level best to show up for yourself and i i wholeheartedly would want to 
I I wholeheartedly love you. Uh, would try my level best to protect. Would would protect you. I wholeheartedly love you. Would uh, give my best to pro- uh, to take care of you, to protect you, to be with you as much as I can, to show up for you even if no one is showing up because you are not alone. You have. <laughs> You have me. So this is what I want to say to little Parul or Meher, and that's what I love. You're not there. You have me, and I'm there for you. Don't worry. You're not gonna fight it alone. You don't have to struggle. Alone. You don't have to. Uh, yeah, you don't have to feel that you don't have uh, no one by your side, but you have me, inshallah. That's what I. That's what I would want to say to myself when I sleep. Inshallah. You know, just being you, the work that you're doing over in India and for those Asian countries is so needed. We want to continue to network and partner with you to help healing. We want to continue to partner with you to ensure that people like yourself and others that are dealing with trap and DV and sexually based offenses and these other true crimes that they're experiencing, that they know that not only that, that they know not only are they not alone, they have a voice, they should use their voice and their words and and be encouraged to persevere through all of this shit. Because at the end of the day, you have to be your best and your own advocate. You also need to know that you're not on an island. There's 8 billion people with a B on the planet Earth. If you live to be a million years old, you will never meet every living person on the planet. So you don't have to feel like you're alone because you have people like Maher and others that she networks with. Because you got a whole network of folks that you partner with over in Asia as well as here in the States. You know, myself, Leah, others that we met in Clubhouse. So if you don't know what Clubhouse is, you can download it in the Google Play Store or on your Apple device. You also can download Club Deck, D-E-C-K. That is for your Windows or MacBook. It will give you access to a great social media platform, audio only, where there's a bunch of clubs and rooms that are set up that address any topic. It could be from A to Z. It could be something serious like what we're talking about. It could be party and bullshit conversations. It could be reality show type conversations. Some of the rooms have the replays on where if you don't listen to that room live for whatever reason, you can listen to the archive recordings of that particular room or that particular topic and subtopic. Some of the rooms have the replays off. That is like a room that I co-moderate. It's called Eating Disorders and Disorder Eating. That's every Tuesday at noon Eastern time, generally for an hour. Uh, The replays are off in that particular room because we want people to feel like they can share without being recorded officially. So uh, it's a great, great social media platform. And there's a lot of mainstream celebrities that either hold rooms or are part of some of these rooms and conversations. Meher, do you have any last words that you want to say to our listeners on the work that you're doing or anything that you got coming down the pike? We call this our shameless plug segment. What you got coming up? So we will be coming up uh, more on our webinar soon. I'm I'm writing my ebook, so probably oh. by end. I'm not sure by when I'll be ready with it. So that ebook is more about uh, how to uh, manage your trauma trig- multiple trauma triggers. As I said, a lot of people I work with, women I work with, they go through uh, a lot of a lot of you know, it. So I'm writing writing a book for them uh, so that it should uh, help uh, help them or give value to them, inshallah. And uh, yeah, I think uh, doing lots, lots of podcasts and public speaking things so that I can 
help uh, a lot of women by through a lot of you know uh, because i i know a lot of women who are sitting before i close on i would want to say i know i know, know a lot of them who look amazing they look amazing the you will no one none of us probably can even guess what they are going through right and i know you are you are there you are in that place and you don't have to do it alone you don't have to keep suffering the reason i do the kind of work i do i it's not over promising because it's simple larry one thing i realized through my trauma journey as i spoke a lot of it not most of it but a, a lot of it is that when i went through all of this i i i wanted to feel that part again because i used to feel completely powerless being abused being i don't know what all i i don't want to uh, trigger people but literally being maybe exploited or a completely abused messed up and that's what people around me made me feel at the same time and that's what i want felt you know i wanted to get my part not just my power back but i wanted to fly again <laughs> i wanted and i still want that i still want to fly again i still want to fly high as much high i can shall i and i i know how it feels i what it if what it means for women like us and that's why i said that uh, if you want to feel that yes i can help you do that because i have done it for me i am trying to do it for me even now so let's connect and if you feel connected and we can i can we can help you let's let's do it let's do it that's right let's do it we got to put in the work faith without works is dead even if you don't have any religious beliefs or what have you it's still relative you got to put in the work and you got to believe it I want to thank Maher for joining us today. We're going to have Leah join us for her thoughts about this great interview. And we're also going to jump into our closing segment, which is the missing persons case. So what we do is we cover a missing person case at the end of every interview. Uh, this missing person case is about a young man. His name is Ferguson. Ocaster Ferguson and dating a woman named Kayla Kelly. But before we get to that, I want to bring my hair back on for her final thoughts. And so I want to I want to say to you, peace and blessings be upon you and your family forevermore. We thank you so much for your insight and your expertise. Let us know when, where, and how we can assist you in this fight. We're in that foxhole with you. And we want to also let every listener know it's your website, which is genuineconversationswithmahair.com. And I got that on the screen right now. And also they can follow you on your IG page, which is meherparul.org. Meher right. yep. I got the information on the screen. I'll have it in the links in the show notes when your episode premieres. That's pretty much it. We love you. Definitely, you're always welcome to come back. We're going to have you back for another segment later on this year because I got some very specific things that I want to highlight from a worldwide perspective also. And we just don't have a whole lot of time to cover everything that we want to talk about on these podcasts. And this is why we've extended this stigma, stereotype, and taboo past one episode. You know, we're, this is episode four. We got more to come. We're going to bring in other folks from a worldwide perspective because these things happen everywhere, folks. This is not just a United States problem. This is not just a problem in India. This is not just a problem on the continent of Africa. This is a worldwide problem and problem. And we're going to approach it from that perspective. Thank you, Maher. You have a great day and I'll talk to you later. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you so much for everything. All right, folks. So again, we're going to bring Leah on in a few moments. I want to cover this missing person case real quick. And so again, this case is brought to us by Mrs. LP our resident true crime detective who also is a missing person expert. And she gave me this story recently. It's about a young man named Ocaster Ferguson. And the story is actually about his 
deceased wife, uh, or he was married and he was dating a woman named Kayla Kelly. Let me play this story for you guys real quick because it's very interesting. I'm telling you, you want to hear about it. I want to have the link to this story listed in the show notes like we do each episode. Kayla Kelly, did we are trying to figure out what happened in terms of who actually committed the crime. Mr. Ferguson is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. So we just want people to understand that even if we mention somebody's name that might be attached to the case, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. That's our bottom line. Uh, we don't make any judgments. We don't put it out there like, you know, we totally believe this person did it because, again, we can't prove it. We're not a court. We're not judges. So we highlight these stories, put it in the hands of the viewers and the listeners and say, hey, you can believe it. You don't have to believe it. You can follow up on the story. Some of these cases that we cover end up on court TV. And uh, we did a story last year about Christian Ferguson and his mom, who <coughs> successfully fought for his case to be brought to court in the case of Missouri versus Ferguson, where his dad, Dewan Ferguson, was not only tried but convicted after 19 years of the death of Christian Ferguson. It was a primarily circumstantial case because Christian Ferguson's body hasn't been found. He was nine years old. He was missing since 2003. Still missing. We don't know where his body is. And so, fortunately, justice was done in that case. And not only has that man been convicted of that crime, but he's been subsequently convicted of a number of other cases involving minors, young ladies. So, thank you. Peace and blessings to everyone. We want to say, live in awareness, never live in fear. Keep your head on swivel. Situational awareness is important. Take a first aid CPR, AD class, learn how to do the Heimlich. Take a stop the bleed training. We want you to be a Baidu instead of being a bystander. If you see something, say something. I don't care what it is, where it is, and what it's about. We want you to be an immediate responder because the life that you save may be your own, an intimate partner, a family member, a friend, or a stranger. Until a first responder like myself shows up and can take over patient care. For the Trigger Want to Talk podcast, I'm, I just have to say, keep coming back, like, subscribe, and follow us on YouTube, which is Pen Pen Consultant Solutions, LLC. You can watch these videos on Spotify. LP out.